Michelle Athar Shaw is a graduate of University of Wisconsin, Madison and Lahore University of Management Sciences, LUMS. Since the past five years, she has been serving in Aquat in different roles and is currently working as the head of projects overseeing the operations and implementation of various projects in the field of education, community development, and inclusion of marginalized communities. She has also been involved in piloting projects, facilitating collaborations between partners, conducting research, trainings, and representing the organization locally and internationally. I'm going to shift the gear a bit um, to focus on South Asia and share with you a kind of unconventional model called Akhuat. So I am here representing Akhuat, which is one of the largest welfare organizations in Pakistan. We've been working um, since 2001 on a financial inclusion, on providing quality education, and a bunch of different projects that I'm going to you know, go over in my presentation. So um, before we start, I'm going to take you back to 2001 and how Akhuat actually came into being. So our founder um, and chairman, who is Dr. Amjad Saqib, he's a former bureaucrat, um, and he has dedicated his life to found um, Akhuat, which is one of which is an organization committed to alleviating poverty. So our vision really is to create a poverty-free society using tools such as industry microfinance and free-free education to really empower the local citizens of Pakistan. You know, if we talk about the statistics, um, almost around 25% of Pakistan's population is under poverty. And in order to empower them and uplift them from this crisis, there's no one intervention or one program that can do the job. It really requires partnership and collaboration between the civil society, between de development organizations, and also with the government. And, you know, who has been fortunate to be um, able to do so. So our philosophy actually um, starts, it stems from the word called Mawakhat. And Mawakhat actually means solidarity or brotherhood. It's the bond between the haves and have-nots of society. So what, at Akhuat, we truly believe that, you know, those of us who come from privileged backgrounds, if we adopt, you know, and form a bond of solidarity and brotherhood with those um, brothers and sisters who are less privileged, we'll be able to help pave a sustainable pathway out of poverty. So when we started, we started with interest-free microfinance, and I'm going to quickly talk about that as well. But since then, since 2001, we have expanded our realm from microfinance to now projects in the education sector. We have a program for transgenders. We have a health services program as well. We also do some community development activities, a food bank, and also a clothes bank. So I'm going to quickly walk you through the you know, the achievements that we've had so far, we're far from where we want to be, but the, you know, the efforts that we have made and the success we have achieved, I'd like to share that as a case study for you to maybe learn from and uh, replicate in your own communities. So what we started with was Islamic microfinance or interest-free microfinance. And the story um, how, of the, how that started was that a widow came to our founder back when back in 2001 and she approached him and she said that i want um, you to give me a loan of 10000 rupees at that time that was around 100 dollars and she said that i'll give that back to you in 6 months but i don't want it as a grant i want it as a loan and at that time our founder you know he reached out to a couple of friends he got that amount and he gave that to her not expecting her to come back because you know as you might be aware um, there is this misconception that when you give money to the poor, they are not trustworthy. They're not going to pay it back. So, you know, with those thoughts in mind, he just gave her the money and thought that, okay, you know, this is just some money that I've given in charity. So to his surprise, uh, six months later, that woman returned and she shared her story about how with that small amount, she was able to buy some stitching machines and start her sewing business at home. And with the amount, uh, with the earnings that she had, she was able to get, send her daughters to school and also get one of her daughters married in a very simple wedding ceremony. So she came back uh, with a request, which was that this amount that you have given me, please pass it on to somebody else so they can also benefit the way that I have. And that's really how the idea of a khuat came about. Um, you know, since we started with a loan of 10,000 rupees. We have now to date um, dispersed over 250 billion rupees in interest fee loans to over 4 million families all across Pakistan. And our model is quite unconventional. It's a bit different in the way that you can see in some of the pictures that I've put on this on the presentation. 
we really work to minimize our operational costs. And we do that by having, uh, you know, very simple offices with floor seating. And this is for two reasons. One, it cut, cuts down our operational costs. And the other reason is that when a poor person comes and walks in the door, they, they have uh, that uh, bond of uh, relatability with us, right? So it's not like they're walking into a fancy office and they're, they're walking into a bank and then they're going to get a loan. But they understand that, okay, these are people who are just like us and they're not um, giving us charity, but they're actually trying to help us and empower us. So it's more of a partnership. So this is how um, a Kuwait's model started. And some of the unique you know, selling points that we do have, and I'd like to mention those over here because I think that those are the points that truly make us different, is that, um, A, of course, we operate with zero interest. So our model charges no interest. Uh, the loan amount that we give, that same loan amount we get back within a year or two years, depending on the uh, loan recipient. And the other thing is that we operate out of religious centers. And um, these are not limited to mosques. Of course, Pakistan is a predominantly Muslim country, but we have um, you know, religious minorities. So we go to their temples, we go to their churches, and over there we uh, disperse the loans to encourage a religious places as being community centers and to naturally create a system of accountability as well. So we don't sign any contract that you, know, you have to pay this back, but naturally, you know, sitting in those uh, spaces, religious spaces, they have this, um, you know, they vow to repay the loan back. And when a Akhwat started, you know, a lot of people would question us about this model is not sustainable because a lot of the times economics can't justify such a large, uh, you know, this kind of a model working. But you'll be surprised to know that, you know, we have a rate of recovery of 99.9%. And that goes uh, a long way to just prove that the poor who are often, um, you know, misconceived uh, as to be not, they're not trustworthy or they're not credit worthy. Who its model has really defied those myths, right? If you, uh, we really believe that if you are lending out a hand of support to somebody in need, they are going to, you know, pay you back. They are going to form, form that bond of brotherhood. So even a lot of our uh, beneficiaries, they actually become our donors as well. So that doesn't mean they give us a huge amount of money, but depending on the capacity that, that they do have, they pay us back because they really believe in the philosophy that we're promoting, which is that we're helping you today so that you can help somebody else tomorrow. And that's the model that, you know, who it stands on. So I, you know, sharing with you some of the progress that we've had since 2001, since we started, um, we have a rate of recovery of 99.91%. Um, we now have offices all across Pakistan. So we have 800 branches in over 400 um, cities. And another one of our unique selling points is that we don't give loans just to the male or the female head of the household, but we give a family loan. So if, uh, if a man is coming to us to ask for a loan, the female head of the household is also going to co-sign that loan because we truly believe that you can't empower an individual, but it has to. you have to empower a family altogether. So all of the employees who work at Afua, the staff that we have, you know, the board of directors, they really resonate with our philosophy of mawakhat um, and that spirit of volunteerism, which we try to really spread across, um, you know, the country as well. Akhwat's case study, um, our microfinance projects case study, is also taught at Harvard and a bunch of different other, you know, renowned universities as well, because we're promoting a model that is replicable, that is scalable. And that, you know, really goes beyond just SDG number one with no poverty. But when you are empowering a family and they are able to initiate and start their businesses, that's automatic, automatically going to have an effect on the education, the quality of education that they're uh, providing to their family or, you know, the spend, uh, the spend that they have on health, for example. So our model is more so very holistic um, and it promotes that kind of, um, you know, a virtuous cycle, as we say. So contrary to the vicious cycle that we often hear about, what at Akhwat, what we're trying to do is really promote a virtuous cycle of reciprocity, of, uh, um, you know, volunteerism, of brotherhood, of solidarity, so that we can really help our citizens uplift themselves out of poverty and form sustainable pathways out of poverty as well. So I think the key word over here is sustainable because, um, you know, oftentimes we say that Afuat is not a charity organization, it's a development organization. And the difference between the two is this, right? It's not that we're giving somebody one-time support only, but we're thinking about what they're going to do for themselves and their families in the longer run. 
So this is um, our flagship program, microfinance, but which we've been doing since 2001. But we've also expanded into uh, the realm of education. And, you know, I'll shift the gear to tell you a bit about our education projects. The pictures on the screen you can see are of two of our campuses. Um, so our founder, Dr. Amjit Saqib, he really believed that if we're providing loans without interest, then education as a fundamental human right should be provided without charging any fee. And that's exactly what we did. Right. So we have um, uh, college campuses that cater to the underprivileged segment of society, to students from, again, all across Pakistan. We ensure that all the provinces are catered to and we welcome students from um, families who really can't afford uh, to send their children to school. So we call them to our campuses. Both these pictures that you can see on the screen are residential facilities. And uh, over here, we don't only focus on academic excellence, but we focus on leadership skills and providing um, these students, our boys and our girls, um, with the skills that they can actually start, you know, earning, um, where they can start working from home, if that's what they are comfortable with, and really prepare them for the uh, job market and promote a very entrepreneurial mindset. So we also have a, um, over 500 primary schools that we've adopted. Even with these schools, we they, they used, used to be pri um, primarily, they used to be ghost schools. So the infrastructure was there, but there were no students coming in. So we've worked uh, on teacher training, on quality enhancement, and also on the attendance to ensure that the, that this, uh, the government schools that we have, the, the areas that they're located in and they're serving, that no child should be out of school. You might have heard that there are over 22 a million children out of school in Pakistan, right? And that's a very alarming number. Um, we also have one of the highest um, youth populations. So when we see that such a large chunk is out of school, it really, you know, it uh, it's painful for us to see because it's so much talent which has nowhere to go. So we're trying to create opportunities for them so that they know that, you know, just because their financial resources didn't allow them, that's not a good enough reason for them to stay out of school. So we've been working on um, our education programs as well. Another one of our smaller programs is called our Clothes Bank. Um, and what we do over here is that from all across Pakistan, we collect clothing, um, excess clothing that people have, which are in very good conditions. And then we pack them and clean them and sort them and gift them to those families who don't have uh, you know, the, the opportunity to buy new clothes for themselves. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share with you an incident that uh, one, one time when I was on the field um, in one of the schools that I was visiting, there a principal reached out and she said that, you know, there are two siblings that come to uh, the school, but they take uh, they come on alternate days because they only have one pair of shoes at home. So that's why, like, one day the sister comes and the other day the brother comes. So this is the reality of, you know, the condition of poverty that that we're facing on the ground. So we are trying to play a small part to, you know, eradicate that so that we can, you know, we can at least say that, you know, um, in events such as like Eid um, or, you know, for Christmas, for the Christian families that we have in Pakistan, there's nobody who is left without a smile on their face. And even though our efforts are very humble, um, you know, they're still ongoing and we're envisioning them to get even larger um, with the passage of time. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have a Khwaja Sira support program. Khwaja Sira is a local term used for transgenders. Um, they are one of the most um, isolated and marginalized groups in Pakistan. So what we have done is that uh, we're one of the first organizations and one of the very few working for this uh, problem in Pakistan that we are providing them with the training so that they can start their own businesses. So that is one thing that we're doing. Another thing that we do is we offer monthly medical checkups for them. Um, we help them get their identity cards done and uh, we provide them with a nominal stipend, um, right? So that they can also just, you know, carry forward the things that they want to do. But I think one of the most important things that we're doing for the Fajr community, specifically in the transgender community, is that we're providing them a platform where they can build a community. And along with working for financial inclusion, I think social inclusion is one of those issues that without it, no matter how financially empowered you are, you will feel isolated and alone. So all our programs um, at Afuat, they have a very localized approach, right? So we really want, uh, we really focus on going down to the level of the community and promoting a bottom-up approach. 
So it's not that we decide what is best for you, but we help them find the financial resources. We help them, we mentor them in a way so that they can uplift themselves out of poverty. One of our other programs is our health services program. Uh, this is specifically more so geared towards the diabetic patients that we have. Um, we provide affordable and effective healthcare services for those uh, patients who, uh, who cannot afford to purchase their own medicines. We have health camps for them as well. And uh, to date, we, you know, the numbers are there on the screen for you to see. We have treated over, um, you know, six, uh, 100,000 patients so far. One of, um, you know, my personal favorite programs in our, is our community development program. So what we do over here is that we adopt a village or it can be in a rural setup or it can be in a semi-urban setup. And we uh, try to make it into a model village or a model town. And in this community development project, we don't only focus on one intervention. So all the previous projects that you've seen on the screen, be it industry microfinance, uh, be it education, be it health drives, we take all of our programs and we apply it um, into a village or into any town that we've adopted. So the pictures on the screen that you can see um, are of one of the towns which is close from Lahore. Uh, um, it's around a 45 minute drive. What we did over there is that we uh, adopted around 1000 households. So one of, and then we went, uh, we went down on the ground and we did surveys and we had meetings with the community members and we asked them, okay, what are the problems that you're facing? How can we help you solve them? Right. So they raised some points of uh, the lack of skill training, the opportunities for women specifically. So we started a stitching center over there. We started giving IT skill trainings. And um, one of the key problems that they raised was a, 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 the lack of a waste management system. So we've made one of the three or four solid waste management plants um, in that town um, that is now, you know, working to keep those streets clean. So as you can see in the picture on the left side, this was not the condition when we first went in. Right. So. But you know, you'll be happy to know that this is not uh, the work that Ahua did by itself. We made community leaders and we went down on the ground and we asked them that, okay, you have to join hands with us. Uh, we're going to help you out, but you're going to do you know, the work in partnership with us. And this is, this is a result of that. We also gave them industry loans for solar, for um, to build any of their washrooms, um, for housing, for agriculture, for livestock. So these are some of the examples of how we you know, did the work that we did. Our food bank, I think more relevant to today, today's discussion about um, you know, zero hunger. Uh, we have a food bank working in the same community that is providing freshly cooked meals every day to at least 200 people. We also provide ration, um, which is enough to you know, sustain a family for at least one month, a family of around six to seven. So these are our humble efforts for that. And then, so during times of disaster um, such as COVID and such as the floods that happened in 2002, we've also been working for relief, uh, for rescue and for rehabilitation. So in these efforts, we've been providing food supplies, medical supplies, um, and you know, more, uh, more I think to share with you is that uh, we, we focus on again, providing them the opportunity so that they could empower themselves for the in the longer run. Uh, and for that, we gave them interest free loans to rebuild their houses. So some of the pictures you can see here are after the damages of the floods in 2022, where around 33 million people in Pakistan were affected. So these are some of our efforts. Um, I know it's a lot of different efforts that we've been doing. And it's because of the show, uh, because of the lack of time, I would want to go into more detail. But you know, we're here to share with you some of the success that we've had. And if you know, and if you have questions, we'd be happy to answer those as well. Um, I will end with this um, slide and saying that, you know, our founder often says to us that um, if one person is poor, then we are all poor. And our efforts at Afuat are, you know, for all of the staff that we have, we are really working to play our part to make sure that there's one less um, poor person in Pakistan, right? We really want to help them form sustainable pathways out of poverty. And I say that again and again, because I think that is the only key way that we can help, uh, you know, our citizens. So thank you so much.